the scene to start today. Uh, so, where are we going? Got a lot of stuff we need to cover. Um, I'll start with the slides and go from there. Um, I want to share PyCharm and I want to share my terminal as well. Okay, so let's go to the slides for today. Uh, we're going to talk about homework, I'm mean, sorry, lab 10. Um, cover something about the final and then move on. Lab 10, we'll talk about in just a minute. Project three is not out. Uh, I hope to have it out tonight. Uh, it was about to be released and I ran it through one more time and found a really strange bug. And I will not release a project that I cannot get working. So that will be out, I hope, tonight. I will probably cut it down to make it less time consuming on your part because I know I'm taking time away from you. You're supposed to have on that. Um, and I will put out word on all the channels when I get it out. So apologies, that's on me, but it will get out there. Um, we were asked to uh, talk to all students briefly about what's going on with the final exam and the grade policy. So uh, all CompSci 201 students, you as well as the major section, have a common final period. Okay, I've announced this before, but again, Friday the 15th of May, two weeks from this Friday, 6 to 8 p.m. The registrar seems to believe that people who take comp sci classes don't have anything else to do on Friday nights because we always get the Friday night 6 to 8 slot for this final, at least in my experience. So it just is what it is. Uh, the exam you take will be on Blackboard just like exam two. That, much to my pleasant surprise, seemed to work out okay. Uh, the bullet about seems to cut down on cheating. I hate to say this, but, you know, um, so Hamilton and Johnson in the majors class did a partial on Blackboard exam and a partial take home. Here are some programming problems that were, you know, a little bit harder than I gave you on the Blackboard exam. Uh, Hamilton was sort of frosted that he spent all night the night before coming up with three programming problems for the test that he considered, you know, appropriate level. And within an hour of the test being released, all three of them were out on the internet. Uh, there's a site called CHEGG, C-H-E-G-G, -G, if you haven't heard of it, which stands for cheating here everywhere. And I forget what the two Gs are. Basically, you, you put your test problem out there and somebody tells you how to answer it. And if you're, lucky they give you the wrong answer if you're unlucky they give you the right answer and all 33 of you submit the identical answer without even bothering to change a variable name or a comment which means that our cheating detection software immediately flags it and then we get to deal with whether you just fail the course or get kicked out of umbc which is unpleasant um so all of that being said, the bottom line is you're going to get a test that's all on Blackboard and you have two hours. I know a number of you uh, are in the situation of, of accommodations. If you need accommodations because you don't think you'll be able to take the test in that two hour period, that's fine. We will work with you. Uh, make sure you contact Student Disability Services so SDS can make arrangements to be and we can, you know, Let's you take the test at a different time under different conditions where you'll have more than two hours or whatever is appropriate with you. That's fine. I understand that. I support that fully, but please contact SDS uh, so we can make alternate arrangements. Otherwise, you have to be online between 6 and 8 p.m. on Friday. Yes, I will put a practice exam out. It'll be available no later than May 8th because the lecture period of May 11th, that last Monday class, we will spend the bulk of time going over the final, the, the, the practice final and what to expect. In terms of um, the grading policy, as I, I hope you're aware by now, 
Uh, UMBC has announced that all students in all classes will have the option of switching from a grade, a letter grade to pass fail. You will see your letter grade before you have to make the option. Um, I will have your grade in no later than May 27th, which is the Wednesday after Memorial Day. I hope far before that. It'll depend on how fast we can get program three graded. You will see your letter grade before you have to decide whether it's the grade or pass fail. So you will see your grade and then you will let me know, eh, I'll take the A, it's cool. Or you will let me know, nah, this is gonna hurt my GPA. I just want to pass. So that is out there. There's no pressure. You don't have to guess how you're doing on the final. It's simply a matter of you see your letter grade. If you choose pass fail, your letter grade gets erased and you get the pass. Um, I don't think anyone is in danger of failing. I hope not. The only way you could do that at this point is pretty much just, you know, taking a zero on the final, which please don't do. So that is where we stand on grading and final. I know we've been slow getting your previous grades back to you. We're getting that cleared up. We're getting that worked. Uh, so hopefully you'll know long before the final. But at any rate, the bottom line is you do not have to let me know until after you know what your grade is, whether you want pass, fail, or, or the letter grade. Okay, now lab 10 related stuff. So what does this virtual end and VN stuff? I gave you some pointers. I gave you some links to the documentation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over it. But here's what's going on, and here's what Lab 10 does. Conceptually, when you write a program, you write a program that runs on your computer's hardware. Not necessarily directly, as I said, but, but, but you know, the operating system, and that's it. It runs on Windows, or it runs on a Mac, or it runs on Linux. You use the CPU chip to do your computation. You use the network interfaces to communicate with whatever you need to over the network, a website or whatever. You read from and write to RAM and, and hard drives or solid state drives. But in the real world, there's a lot of problems with doing that. I mean, it's expensive. Dedicating an entire machine to a program or a couple of programs, is, it makes it very inefficient. It's hard to keep multiple threads or programs running at the same time when they're all writing, you know, as, as we used to say, partying on the hardware. Um, the, um, another reason is for security. I mean, it gives you access potentially to anything that's on the computer. So hopefully nobody left anything there they didn't want you to see. And even if security is not an issue, you're programming on your own PC, it's safety. Even if it's not malware, your bugs can mess up the system. So in general, most program these days, and particularly when we're talking about cloud computing with Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or something like that, with cloud computing, you create what's called a virtual environment. A virtual environment is, is called sometimes a sandbox. It's a limited world where you can go play by yourself and you can't harm anybody else. Have fun, do what you want. It looks like the beach, but you can't hurt anybody else. Just play over here. To your code, it looks like a real computer. And that's awesome because you can do everything you can do on a real computer in this virtual environment. Um, in the commercial world, in the government world, people who are doing computing like that will use uh, software like VMware, software like Microsoft Hyper-V. Um, if you've got a Windows 10 box, I gave you the link to the root of the of Hyper-V documentation. You can look at setting up a full uh, hyper uh, virtual machine on your Windows 10 box so that you can't accidentally mess something up. Um, and if you don't want a full virtual machine, you'll hear the technology, you'll hear the term containers. People run virtual environments as containers. There's a product called Docker. Uh, there's another one called Kubernetes, which is all out of Google. Google provides that as how to do it. Uh, OpenShift is Red Hat Linux's uh, version of the same thing. The trade-off you get by creating a virtual environment is that you can have more code running, you have more people doing things at the same time. Um, but, or, I'm sorry, you have more code running, you have fewer resources available because I can't give you the full real machine, 
but I get a lot of safety and security out of that. So the benefit of, of running this virtual environment is I get a whole lot of safety and security. I can't max, I can't mess everything up. The only drawback is if somebody really does a full, honest by gosh, machine to do everything, um, it takes a little bit more. So in lab 10, what we did is we asked you to play with, to set up a virtual environment VN and then run your code in that virtual environment on a shared server GL. And again, the reason why we ask you to do that in lab 10 is because if you go very far in your career, you're gonna be doing a lot of that. I mean, some stuff you're gonna do on your Mac, on your Windows box, on your own Chromebook or whatever, but most of the stuff you're gonna be doing in virtual environments of one kind or another. So what I'm going to do for you is walk through lab 10. It's not due till tomorrow night, but I want to make sure that we've got some things that everybody understands what's going on. Uh, and the key to it is, is to ask you how many links are on www.umbc.edu. So let's walk through um, lab 10. Now we ask you to run a program if you, you know create a separate directory so I'm in my I'm in my labs directory and we'll see that I've already done this but I'll talk about how I got here um, when you run this is actually a bunch of code written by Dr. Johnson uh, Dr. Mitchell Susan Mitchell used this lab last semester and I decided rather than trying to recreate my own I just use theirs it's a cool thing when you type the command virtual and vn i've already done this it just takes a few seconds you get this vn directory created in your lab 10 in my case it's just labs uh, directory and that is the virtual environment and that will let you do things that you can't necessarily do anywhere else now there's a gl to get that going you type i believe the um Command is source vn slash bin slash activate. I think I'm already active, If I'm, in which case I'll get an error message. Yeah, the badly placed parents is because I'm already active. Um, now, if I want to get a, um, the next step in the lab is to get these going as a shell. GL has this weirdness where bash is the born again shells, the command line processor, and you need to have it running. You don't always have to type bash, but with bash, I now say, okay, I am now running in the born again shell. I am now running with the same command lines that I had before. So now you notice the fact that I'm running in my account at Linux in labs, what have you is now hidden. I'm just running with a bash shell. I am now programming on GL exactly like I'm supposed to. Okay. Now, next, the homework asks you to download and install using pip the request package. I've already done that, so I won't show it to you, but we installed some other things with pip. Um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward process. If anybody has problems with it, let me know. It should not be an issue. Then we ask you to create this program called getpage.py and I'll cat getpage.py to show you what it looks like when you're done. This is it. There's no functions, there's no subparts, there's just import requests. And as I said, I installed requests using pip install. If your system doesn't recognize import requests when you try to type this, um, in all likelihood, the pip install did not work properly. Go back and check that one. So now you import requests. And now the code, if name equals main. Uh, I'm going to use a function from the request package that I installed called get. So I say requests.get. And I'm going to go to the UMBC homepage and I'm going to install it as text. Then I'm gonna print it so you can see what it looks like. Then I have to count the number of links. So let me show you what that means. Let me switch to back to Chrome. This is the UMBC website, which you're going to um, 
download. Now it's got all this fancy graphics. It's got videos. It's got sound. It's got whatever. Okay. It's a nice website. I like UMBC's website. A link is anything where when you mouse over it, it says you can click here and go someplace else. So UMBC has an about link, which when you click on about, Oh, I am on about, which is why. Let's click on academics. And it will take me to areas of study and it can show me some other stuff and graduation and, and all this other things. Okay. But this is the UMBC page. Now let's right click or control click on that. And you will notice that the menu pops up. If you're on Windows, this is generally a right click on the link rather than the then a left click if you click. If you are on a Mac, it's control click. And I'm going to choose this option on the menu called inspect. And when I inspect, I get a window that pops up. And because I'm using Chrome, it looks like this. It'll look slightly different if you're using Firefox or Internet Explorer or Safari, but it's it's all the same. And the blue highlighted over here is what the link. Remember, the link was that thing that popped up on academics or about or whatever. That's a link. What this blue thing highlights is what the actual text, what the actual program code behind that looks like. That is what makes it look like what you see on the page. And you'll notice it starts with a left angle bracket or less than sign if you prefer, followed by A, followed by ID equals. If I can make this bigger. Now, the, okay. A little bigger. Okay. This is what I'm talking about. This is where it starts. It starts with this left angle bracket, A, I, D equals. And then we have a bunch of stuff that tells it what a drop down menu looks like and what goes in the uh, drop down menu and what have you. And it tells it a bunch of other stuff. This is all HTML code. This is all hypertext markup language code that tells your browser how to render what was on the menu. The key thing is here that we hint in this lab. This link ends with a left bracket or less than slash a greater than or right bracket. This uh, angle bracket slash a angle bracket. This will end every single link. So if you want to find a link, in UMBC's web page, you can search for that pattern, those four characters together, because it is almost impossible to have those four characters together and not be the end of a link. You actually could put it inside a comment and, and screw everything up. We're not going to go there. We're going to say if there's a left bracket uh, less than uh, slash a. If there's a left bracket slash a right bracket, that is a link. Now, this thing that you see on my screen with the text and the elements here, that's, what's get, that's what gets downloaded to GL. When you downloaded this text, you're going to see that. Okay. So let's go back to my terminal now. And once again, we see that I have get page.py. You see what the code of get page does. It downloads this thing as text, and it prints the, uh, the page, okay? So I'm going to run it like any other Python program, and it's going to take a while, and it's going to print out a big honking bunch of text. Now, if this looks vaguely familiar, that's because I just showed you what that looked like in Chrome. This is the UMBC home web page in nothing but text. And Chrome or Safari or whatever 
will render this, will interpret this and display it as all the fancy video and graphics and links and everything else. Okay, remember, here's the end of a link. That's one link. Here's the end of a link, that's two links. Here's the end of a link, that's three links. So what I did, given the hint that split is your friend, if I go all the way back up, I said, split this text, split this whole page on this four character sequence. In other words, every time Python, you see that four character sequence that determines the end of a link, you split, you create a new list element. Now, I mean, the, that four character pattern gets thrown away, but I don't care. Now, the question is, how many of them were there? How many links did it find? Well, I take the end of the link, the, the length of the list right here. The length of the list, after splitting the list on this character and throwing them out, how many? How list elements were there? How long was the list? And the answer I got appears to be 33,668. Now, two things to point out about this. Number one, if you get a slightly different number than I did, it may be that they've changed the UMBC webpage. They do that. They put out a new link because there's a coronavirus update, or they put out a new link to congratulate someone who has won an award or a staff member has retired, or some new event is out. They do change the number of links. So if you didn't get exactly the same number I did, but you're in the ballpark, okay, that's pretty good. Um, that's the number I got. However, one caveat. Remember, that is the length of the list I got by splitting on these link symbols. That number will be exactly one more than the number of links. If the list splitting on this character, if the list is this long, the number of links was one less than that. So the actual number of links I got in lab 10 was 33,667. What the heck does that mean? Okay. Let me find pie chart. And let me get a console. <laughs> I'm going to create a string, one comma two comma three comma four. Print x dot split on a comma. Okay, that's a four element list. How many commas were there in X? There was one comma, there were two commas, there were three commas. Splitting on something that there are three of produces a list four elements long, because it's whatever is after the last one. So, no, it won't be on the final, not a huge deal, but, but something to understand. When you split a string, when you split a string into a list, the list you get is always one element longer than the number of things you split on, the number of commas, the number of whatever. So going back to my terminal, when I said to split on these end of links, it's going to produce a, li uh, a list is one element bigger than the number of links it found. So I have a list 
that's now 33,668 elements long. That means there were 33,667 links. So that is roughly what you should get when you do lab 10. Again, if you don't get exactly the same number as me, it is quite likely that UMBC changed its website. Because other than not taking into account that this is off by one, yeah, there's not really a whole lot you could have messed up in the program. So if you're in this area, that's fine. If you get hundreds of thousands, if you get one, now we may have a problem. But if you get in this ballpark, the odds are it was pretty good. And if you're off by one or so, then UMBC changed its. Um, Professor? Yes. Um, so, like, I was just, I guess, playing around. But the, I think we have to, don't we have to set, I guess, the split? statement to a variable and then print out the length of that variable because I guess just printing out the length of get page is the same like that because I got that number too but it's the same before you split it and um Kai Wanthea just said she got 94 and I also got 94. Interesting let's see well that's a good question um let me Edit real time demonstrations. Okay. So let me oops, put the cursor in the right place. Length of page. I'm going to print out the length of the string. Okay. Ah, actually, that's a good point. Okay. Print length of X. All right. Uh, Okay, let's make sure that my changes were saved. Okay, we now have the new code. Very good. Yes, you are correct. I stand corrected. Page is 33,668 characters long, and it's found 95 links. Well, 94 links, right? Because of the length of the list is one larger than 94. So you are, you are correct. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. So with that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when we submit this, should we rename our file from getpage.py to lab10.py? Yes, you should. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't put that in the instructions because, of course, the original one was presuming you'd be sitting there in lab. Uh, makes it easier for Anna and Jordan to grade if it's changed the name. So this system actually doesn't care, but Anna and Jordan do. So yeah, please do. Uh, okay, where am I now? Let's leave the UMBC page. Uh, we'll get to YouTube in a minute. Let me get to my slides. So with that being said, what we're gonna talk about is sorting lists of elements. All of our examples tonight, I'm going to use lists of integers, but it all works the same way. It doesn't matter. It's a list of whatever. As long as all elements of the list are the same type, you can sort them into an order. You can sort uh, letters. You can sort strings. You can sort true-false. There are a number of algorithms that have been developed to sort lists over the years. Some are better than others. The easy one we'll start with first is called bubble sort. 
now suppose you have a list of integers. The way bubble sort works is each time you go through the list of integers, you bubble the largest one to the end of the list. So in other words, I start here with four and I compare it to number two, which one is larger? Four, so I would switch two and four. Then I take four and compare it to 19, which one is larger? 19, so 19 stays there. I compare 19 to 944, which one is larger? 944. 944 to 27, 944 is bigger, so it moves here. 944 to three, 944 would wind up in the last place. So we have gone through the list once and bubble the largest element to the end of the list. And then I can go through the list again and I can, um, Ignore the largest, the last element, because I know it's the largest one. But uh, I can do all the others. Now, since me explaining this with no visual aids is kind of lame, what we're going to do is, you know, YouTube has videos for everything. Here is a short video on bubble sort that explains how things work. Yeah, there's no text. This is just lousy music. But you can see it compares five and one and swaps so five is biggest. Five is bigger than four. Five is bigger than two. Don't move. Don't move. Now, we no longer have to worry about the last element. The nine is the biggest element. It has bubbled to the end. We're done. And what we do each time is go through the list, shorter and shorter. Until the last pass. Now, the thing about this is that if you notice, cheating since we can now visually see we're done okay we're done this list is sorted so we're going to use that to keep track and short circuit this but this is an example of how bubble sort works illustrated a little bit better than i can just wave hands in front of a computer talking about each time through the list you bubble the largest remaining element to the end, and then you move the end of the list in once. You move the list of the end of the list in one element, and then you can um, uh, look at a shorter set. Okay, that is bubble sort. Now the code they have you, they, the code they show you here in this video obviously is not Python. So what does the Python code look like? I actually managed to get this code out. Uh, so this code is in the uh, code samples uh, repository and GitHub already. The, uh, if I change it, I'll fix it in the, uh, as with slides are, there, are up as well. But I decided I would write this both iteratively and recursively. And so what we're going to do is go through the entire list of numbers. We'll look at the iterative procedure first. We'll go through the entire list of numbers, starting at the last element. And I'm going to move, stopping at zero and moving in one time. That's our outer loop. So we're going to, this is how. When I mentioned in the video, when I pointed out they're moving in the end of the list one t one element each time, this is how we do that. We start with the full list and we move in one element each time. And this is what's going to control that. Now, this is, that's overall, this is the code for one pass. 
for one pass through the list, this is the code that does it. For J, we start at zero and we go all the way up to whatever value of I is. We compare. If the current number we're looking at is bigger than the uh, next number, we swap them. This is what they did in the, uh, this is what you saw in the video where they just compared the two numbers and swapped them. Now, yes, there is magic in Python that lets you swap these two values directly without using a temporary. I said, we'll use a temporary so we can explicitly make it clear that this is how we're swapping. There is a way to, to there is a Python statement that lets you swap the values directly. To me, it's less clear, so I don't want to do it in 201. So we don't. Uh, but the bottom line is all we're doing is we're swapping two numbers. This is the code that does one pass through the list, through the remaining list. And I control that. I go through all of the elements of the list with this. OK, to test that, I wrote a main program that generates a 10 element random, uh, a 10 element list of random numbers between zero and nine, okay? And I'm just gonna print it out and then I'm gonna call my iterative bubble sort procedure and I'm gonna print out the sorted list. And I should be able to do this by simply running this entire block of code I wrote. And you can see down here that I generated this list of 10 integers zero through nine. They're not all unique. They don't have to be unique. It would be fine if they were. But going through them, the first thing that happened was the nine got bubbled all the way over to the end. The second thing that happened was that this eight had been swapped into the next to last place by the nine. It stayed there. The next thing that happened is this eight got bubbled through and so on until we finished with a completely sorted list, okay? So that's what this iterative bubble sort procedure did. Now, let's go back to the slides. I don't wanna spend that much time. I, the slides also have the code and I didn't necessarily want to go through it. Um, the bubble sort, this is just another illustration with a, with a different list. I bubbled the largest value through each time and so on. This is the iterative function that I showed you already. Recursively, let me go back to PyCharm. The recursive bubble sort, okay, if we're gonna do recursion, we need a base case and a recursive case that makes the problem a little smaller. So what we're gonna do is our base case is if the list of numbers is one element long. Any list that's one element long is in order. It's in a proper order, it's sorted. There's no need to go any further. We just return it. So this is our base case. If you've got a one element list, we're done. Now, the recursive case is if you've got more than one element in your list, then what you're what you're doing is this is sort of like the iterative procedure above for one pass, right? Remember the code above for one pass through. It's very, very similar to this. Okay. We just go through the list, find the biggest element, or we, we switch each one. When we're through this, we know when, when this for loop stops, we know that the biggest element is in the last part of our list. Now, recursively, we can call the function. We have to make it simpler. We have to make it shorter, right? Well, we know the biggest elements in the last item on the list. Just don't pass that element in the list. So the way we will do it is we will recursively call the function recursive bubble sort, chopping off the last element. Nothing before the colon means send the list starting the beginning. Don't include this element minus one, as you know, is the last element. So this recursive call says 
now call the function with everything but the last element. It's a shorter one. Eventually, we will get to zero. Now, when I get a return from the function, when I get a return from the previous call, if I want to have the full list, I've got to add this back on. Okay. So, in other words, I had a list of four, three, two, one. I bubbled the four to the beginning. My list is now three, two, one, four. I'm going to say, okay, the four is set. Now I want to sort, recursive bubble sort, three, two, one. Eventually, eventually, this call is going to return with a list one, two, three. Then I have to add the four back on. The way I'm going to add the four back on is by saying, this is the result I got back, because this was the this was assigned the value of the call. This is the value I get back. And then I will add to the end of that list this value ahead up here. I didn't need the colon. This would work identically if I just said numbers of minus one. Uh, this was valid too. But this gives me a list now I can sort. So this is just a recursive way of calling the same function. Uh, this is a recursive way of applying the same sorting algorithm. And I will risk everything by trying the live demo, having not previously debugged this code. I debugged this code two days ago, but we are going to find out if it still works with no problems. How about that? It actually worked. And I didn't print the answer. That was really good of me. The point was, this was supposed to give me the same answer. And since I'm generating a random list each time, this is different. It's fine. But you can see, this is the random list I generated. This is how it was sorted by the iterative list. This was sorted by the recursive list. It all works the same. Live demo, take one, actually worked this time. So that is a bubble sort. Now, bubbling the largest value each time to the end of the list. There's a way to stop it, though. I pointed out when we watched that video that we could have stopped, right? There was a point early on when the list we could see through our omniscient view the list was sorted we didn't have to keep going through and comparing but we did they the algorithm they wrote did and the algorithms i just showed you did here's the deal if you make a pass through the list and you don't make any swaps at all if you do not swap any elements in a pass through the list that means the list is sorted. That means you can stop. You don't have to go through anymore. And so what happens is if you go through, and now I'm really going to gamble, I'm going to um, put in a variable called swaps. Swaps is going to be how many times did I let's declare a boolean no swaps equals false while No swaps. Now I'm going to have to indent. Don't 
don't need to indent the return statement. So what's going to happen is if I make a swap, each pass through this, set swaps, number of swaps, zero. And when I make a swap, I'm going to add in n swaps is one. Now, when I'm done, let me make sure I'm in the right place. If n swaps is still equals zero, no swaps equal true. That code will stop. Uh, that code will stop this from executing when we haven't made any changes. If the list is in order, that code will cause it, will cause the program to stop. That is bubble sort. Okay. But bubble sort is inefficient. I mean, it's nice. It's simple to understand. It's easy. Um, it is useful, but it's not efficient. And people came up with other ways. And so there's something called selection sort, which sometimes has an advantage and sometimes doesn't. Selection sort is fairly simple as well. We're going to search through an entire list and find the smallest element and then swap it with the first element of the list. So each time through the list, we're going to put the smallest element we could find in the first spot and then move in. Now, we could do the same thing with putting the big, biggest element at the end like we do with bubble people who invented this algorithm just decided they wanted the smallest to the left rather than the biggest to the right. It's fine. It, it works out the same. But each time through the list, we don't have to go quite as far. We're always going to pick the smallest element. We put it in the next available slot, and we repeat until the entire list is that should not be supported. That should be sorted. Since we select the smallest element from the list, this is called a selection sort. Going back to PyCharm, now we're going to define an iterative version of selection sort. Okay. And it's right here. What we do is we go through the entire list, we set the smallest to i go through it starting from the next one. So in other words, the first time through the list, we say arbitrarily, we're gonna start with the, with the zero element being the smallest, and we're gonna go through, and we're gonna switch anything that's biggest, that's bigger than that, or that's smaller than that smaller element. We're gonna find the index of the smallest, and then we're gonna swap. I messed that all up. Let's try that again in English. We're going to go through, and we're going to keep track of the index of the smallest number. So we are not keeping track of the index of the smallest, of the value of the smallest number, just the index. That's what this one does. It keeps track of the index. Now we go through and we compare each other number to the thing we think is currently smallest. If we find another smaller number, in other words, right here, Number sub j is now smaller, we keep track of that index. And so that gives us the value of the index that is the smallest. That's the reason we do just the index is so we don't do any swaps until the end. Because if I swapped every time I found a smaller number, that would be bubble sort. That would just be bubble sort with smallest instead of largest. So I keep track of the index, and then I have the index. And that will uh, give me 
smallest number first, and now I can go through my loop again um, to the to find the next smallest number. Now, since there's always a YouTube video for everything, there's a slightly different version of how to do a selection sort. And I wish these had some good audio, but what they have is mostly uh, ridiculous. Music, so so here's our initial array. We're going to arbitrarily say the smallest number we've seen is the first one. Oops, a new smaller number. Oops, a new smallest number. Nope, not smaller. Oops, a new smallest number. So now the smallest number is this last one, so we swap first and last. We don't bubble through, we just swap one time. Now we move the array in, a new smallest number. We start at the 25 this time, and we go through the list, and we discover that 12 is the smallest number, so we swap. Select 22, make it next. Now, even though the array is sorted this time with selection sort, there's actually no way of knowing it. There's no way to cut this, this algorithm short. Selection sort is logically simple because you have to go through it every time. Um, there's no way to um, cut it short like we did. So that's an illustration of how selection sort works. It's different from bubble, not just because it's it's um, smallest rather than largest, it's because you're not swapping on every comparison, you're only swapping when you've selected the one you want. Before I forget, before we get back to the slides, on the YouTube channel, because I was going nuts the other day, I actually posted the video of my appearance on Jeopardy, which I showed you a few seconds of at the beginning of the semester. So I suspect Sony will make me take it down for copyright violation sometime, but it's up there on my YouTube channel now if anybody has a half an hour to kill and wants a good laugh. Getting back to selection sort, couldn't we do it recursively? Yes, of course, we could do it recursively. Given that we're running a little bit late on time, I'm not going to illustrate it, but the code is in the um, uh, the code is in the code thing that I posted. It's there. It just does the same thing. Okay. Now, bubble sort, selection sort. Both have their advantages. Selection sorts uh, logically simpler. Both work well sometimes. Bubble sort we can shortcut if we happen to get a sorted array, sorted list. There's another algorithm, and it's called quick sort. And it turns out that on average, it's a whole lot faster to do a quick sort than bubble or selection sort. Logically. It's a little bit more complex, so we're going to walk through it, but on average, it's faster. Now, in the worst possible case, quick sort is um, as bad, it takes as long as bubble or selection sort. But in the average case, I'm sorry, I was distracted by my dogs again. Um, In the average case, it's better. So how does quick sort work? The idea is pick an element in the list. Pick it at random. Pick the first, pick the last, doesn't matter. Turns out from a performance standpoint, picking any element in the list uh, will work. And you call this element you pick the pivot. And the reason you call it the pivot is you're going to pivot the list around it. You're just going to go through the list and sort it so that everything less than the pivot is to the left of it, 
earlier in the list than the pivot. Everything bigger is on the right. It's after the pivot in the list. Okay, so now what we have is two unsorted lists, one to the left, one to the right, but the pivot is in the right place. The pivot is in the correct place. We know that. Now, there's no guarantee that the stuff to the left and the stuff to the right is in any order. They may be completely out of order. But what we're going to do is we're going to recursively call the quicksort algorithm on the algorithms on, on the items on the left and then the items on the right. And yes, there is a video. I just have to find it because I didn't bother bookmarking that one. But I know exactly which one it is. It's this one. This is a little longer because it's more complex. You find the element called a pivot. We hope it divides the list into two halves. It may not at all. That's the worst case behavior, but roughly be a false. It's recursive. Sort the left, sort the right. Now, in this video, as I said, they, they have picked, the pivot is always the last element. You can pick it at random, you can pick it first, it doesn't matter. So what they're doing is now they're going, I'm sorry, question? they're doing is they're going through each element in the list and deciding whether it is bigger or smaller than the pivot. And now they're just moving things around so that everything smaller than the pivot is on the left and everything bigger than the pivot is on the right, which will happen in a minute. They, they could have done this video better, but it was, it was the most reasonable short one I could find. So now the 70 is in the right place. We have an unsorted list of four elements to the left of it and another sort, unsorted list of two elements to the right. Now what we're gonna do, dividing you conquer, now we're only sorting a four element list. We didn't cut the list short by one element. We almost cut it in half from seven to four. Now we're just doing a sort of um, those four elements. Again, they picked 50 and they discovered when they picked 50 as a pivot, they were done. Now they only sorted a two element list on the right. Sorting a two element list is really easy. You're done. So that is, we will end there because this is not even Python code. Um, that is an illustration of how quick sort works. You pick an element as a pivot sort the array, the list, so that smaller things are to the left, bigger things are to the right. And that um, then gives you hopefully two smaller, in a perfect world, you get half the elements to the left, half the elements to the right. And so that gives you two much smaller lists to recursively call. Okay. Uh, on paper, before we code, if we happen to pick um, the number four, the first value four as our pivot. In the video, they pick the last element here. I've arbitrarily picked the first element as the pivot. I go through the list and I say that items less than four are minus two and three and greater than are 19, 9, 44, and 27. And now I just recursively call uh, the sort on minus two and three. I immediately know that minus two and three is sorted. 
So now I have minus two, three, and four. That's good. To the right, I have 19, 944, and 27 because of the way I flip things around. Um, it doesn't take long. Pick 19 is the pivot. 944 and 27 are both greater. So this really quickly converges to sorted list, the advantage. Now, what happens is if you are by really, really horrible luck, always picking an element each time that everything is less than or everything is greater than. If you pick the smallest element or the greatest element every time, this will not work well. It will be as bad as the other sorting algorithms. Uh, next week, when we get into more computer science, so we talk about analysis of algorithms and complexity. Next Monday, we're going to talk about exactly how fast or slow these are. But the some of the videos you can watch actually show you the number of comparisons you have to make. Quick sort, on the whole, on average, is going to be much better because you have much shorter lists to sort. Uh, here is the first part of the recursive code. Here is the second part. And let's go to pie chart. Here is the quick sort code, this function here. You'll notice that I've arbitrarily chosen to pick my pivot as the first element. This is just an arbitrary decision I made. It could have been the last one as they did in the video. It could have been, um, I don't want to waste time and pick the middle value, but I could have picked the value at index one, half the index, it didn't matter. Now, <laughs> what I'm going to do in the video, every number is unique. That's not the reality in most cases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create three lists. I have to start with it being empty. And I'm going to append. I'm going to go through my original list. And if a number is less than my pivot, it goes in the less list with an append. If the number is equal to my pivot, it goes in the equal list with an append. And if it's greater than my pivot, it goes in the greater list with an append. And that's what's happening here. I go through my original list, item by item. I say, if this thing is bigger than my pivot, I append it to my greater list. If this thing equals my pivot, it goes in my equal list. And if this thing is less than my pivot, which means it must be the else clause, I'm going to append it to my less list. Now, what I have are these three lists, and I know that anything in the equal list is in the middle, and I can just keep it there. I will call quick sort recursively on my less list. I will call quick sort recursively on my greater list. And when I get those results, I will append these three lists together with the plus sign. And I will now have a single list that will be the sorted the um, sorted original list. You can, I've asserted before, you can always iteratively, um, you can always define anything, anything you do with recursion, you can do iteratively. That is true here. You can write an iterative solution for quick sort. It is real ugly because these recursive calls get replaced by several nested loop, several nested loops. So you start having loops nested within other loops and loops nested within other loops, and you have to remember where each loop is. It'll work. You can do it. I don't want to bother showing you the code. You can Google if you care that much. Quick sort just naturally is one of those things that's easier to understand if you're doing it recursively. So we have covered three different ways to sort lists of things. As long as they're the same type, you can compare them. Lists of integers, lists of letters, lists of strings, lists of whatever. In Python, we've covered uh, uh, selection sort, where you pick the smallest value and move it. We've covered bubble sort, where you pick a value and bubble it along so that the biggest value winds up at the end. And we've covered quick sort, where you pick a value, throw things around it to the left and the right, recursively call each one. And now you have three different ways of sorting uh, data items.
in addition to sorting, quite often what you want to do is searching. Now, any search that Python does for you, if you have uh, Python search something for you, um, it uses what's called a linear search. A linear search is just exactly what the name implies. Go through the list one item at a time in order from first to last. Stop when you find the right element. If you never find the right element, return failure. That works. I mean, imagine though, if you were given a dictionary, I mean, not a Python dictionary, but imagine if you were given a paper dictionary in the library and you were asked to look up a word. You were asked to look up the word retriever. You could start at page one in the dictionary under A and aardvark and on to whatever is next and stop when you hit retriever in a couple of weeks. Or if for some reason somebody spelled it wrong and it wasn't in there, you could go all the way through to Zimmergy and return, I didn't find it. It would work. You would absolutely get to it if it was there, but it is really inefficient. So we want to improve on searching, on linear searching. We want to do something that's faster. And the technique is what's called binary searching. Now, binary searching, the reason we just talked about sorting a list first, is that binary searching implies that a list is sorted. If the list is already sorted, then we can implement what's called a binary search. And in a binary search, it's split the list in two. Go to the middle item of the list. Go to that item at index length of the list divided by two. Integer, integer divide by two. Okay, because if it was a float divide by two, you could run into problems. Take the middle item of the list. Go from there. Compare it to what you're searching for. Is this greater than or equal to what you're searching for? Go to the middle page in the dictionary. Now, I don't know about you, but as a wild guess, when I looked earlier in my dictionary, uh, the middle page was about in the early M's, somewhere in the MAs, just the way my dictionary was working. Um, well, that means everything on the left side of the list, everything before MA, I can stop looking because MA is less than retriever. It comes before retriever in the dictionary. So I have now thrown out half the dictionary that somebody else is sitting there looking word by word, comparing element by element to see if this is what they need. Okay. So with a binary search, the first thing I do now, I've got the MAs and I'm looking for retriever. Now I only take the back half of the dictionary. First half is gone, tore it off, threw it away, doesn't matter, it's, it's history. Now I take the MAs and from the MAs to Zimmergy, I look and see what's in there. And now I wind up somewhere in the queues, quince. Okay, somebody's grown fruit. Well, retriever is after quince, so therefore I can throw away the part of the dictionary between the MAs and the Qs. I don't need that. I know retriever, if it's in there, is in between Quince and Zimmergy somewhere. And by repeating that, ultimately I will find retriever very, very quickly. It again is a recursive algorithm, simplest, it's recursively. Call the item on a list. Decide if the list, if the item's on the left side or the right side. Recursively call on that part of the list. Okay. In general, if you're familiar with logarithms, you will find the algorithm in, you will find the element you're looking for in the log of base two searches of the length of the original list. If the list is 64 items long, on average, you will find 64 is two to the eighth, you will find the item. No, two to the seventh, 64 is two to the seventh. You will find the item in seven searches, or you will know it's not there in seven searches. So I don't have to look at all 64, I look in seven. Here's the code. We'll go to PyCharm. 
here is the code to do a binary search. Okay. So what we'll do now is we will once again generate, we're going to comment out. our sorting and we're going to generate an element and instead of being 10 elements long it's going to be I'm going to try a hundred I think a thousand may be too big a hundred element list of random numbers and now we're going since these are all digits between zero and nine inclusive I'm going to search for Does binary search recursive binary search return? It returns minus one if it's not found, and it returns the index if it is found. Okay. Random nums. And I'm going to look for the number 11, which I know is not there because everything's between 0 and 9. Okay. Hopefully, I don't have any syntax errors by some of this code modification. There we go. Here is my 100 element random array that was printed out. And I didn't bother printing out X. Here we go. I got a negative one, which is my code for this was not found. Okay. I got a negative one because this was not found. And let's find out how many times it took. I'll, do, I'll show you that next time since we're out of time and doing this live in the last two minutes I have on the clock available for lecture guarantees failure. Uh, but you can imagine if you instrument this, if you just count the number of times binary search um, is will, will take 100, uh, 2 to the 8th is 128. So this should, on average, find the answer or find that the number is not there in in between 7 and 8 lookups. And that's all rather than 100. And even better, if I made it 1,000 instead of 100, right, a 2 to the 10th is 1,024. So if I made this a list of 1,000 elements, I should find it in 10 comparisons. And since we're doing analysis of algorithms next Monday anyway, I'll make sure to put that in there and show you that as, as a result. Um, binary search will find the answer much faster. It finds the right element or it will find that there is no element present. But binary search presumes that the list is already sorted. So you may have to sort the list first. Once you've sorted the list, at that point, lookup is very easy. And I'll give you an example of why that is um, relevant. So many years ago, uh, I worked for a Canadian company. I was the CTO. We had a contract to provide some security software for the government of Hong Kong. This is about 20 years ago, right after the handover, right after they became a, a, a special autonomous region of China. Everyone has, much like we have social security numbers, everyone in Hong Kong has a Hong Kong ID. It consists of a letter followed by six digits. So there's 26 million. If you figure out the permutations, there's about one letter, one capital letter, and six digits. There are 26 million possible Hong Kong IDs. Now, just like here in the US, a Hong Kong ID is considered personally identifying information, and it's supposed to be kept secret. So you cannot reveal it. So they had a technique where they kept it encrypted we would get the value of someone's Hong Kong ID encrypted. Well, somebody got the bright idea and we showed the Hong Kong government this. If you 
took each of the 26 million Hong Kong IDs and encrypted them one at a time and then sorted them into a list. And then you had a list that said, this is what the plain text value was before we encrypted it, and this is what the encrypted value was. And now it's in a list. And now every time we see somebody's encrypted Hong Kong ID, we can go back and tell you exactly what their plain text, real, unhidden, unprotected Hong Kong ID is. Uh, 26 million is roughly um, two to the, if I'm calling this right, it's about two to the 24. So in a total of 24 lookups, we got you. That's it, 24 lookups to have anybody, and that's a worst case, with a binary search after we'd sorted it. And so fortunately, we were able to convince them to change their entire scheme because we said we don't want to be part of this. This is, you know, talk about people's privacy, this doesn't work. If there's 26 million of them and we can build a tree and we can search 26 million items and we will find the exact one in no more than 24 lookups and in Windows uh, XP at the time on an early Pentium computer, it would take less than a second to identify exactly who was doing what. Uh, that's how powerful this search technique is. This is why it's important. So that will do it for tonight's lecture. Um, we've covered the sorting and searching. Uh, I will get the project out as quickly as I can. Um, remember that lab 10 is due tomorrow. Uh, Make sure you get it in. I've showed you through. If you're still having problems with the virtual environment or with the script on GL, let me know. We'll work through it. Um, I think it's been tested enough that it's probably, we're fairly confident it's working. You know, you may be out of quota or something and may cause a problem. But uh, so that should be it. Any last questions? Okay, great. I will talk to you on Monday. Thank you. I'll be available online in the interim. Thank you.